Welcome to International Dispute Negotiation, your guide to resolving disputes everywhere. This is Mike McElrath, and this podcast is about different ways of accepting and managing the risks of dispute resolution, presenting them through the eyes of experts from different countries and backgrounds. Speaking today with Emmanuel Gaillard, who is the uh, head of the international arbitration practice of the Paris office of Sherman and Sterling. Or you're actually the head of the Paris office of Sherman and Sterling. I am the head of the Paris office and the head of the arbitration practice on a worldwide basis. And you're an arbitrator? From time to time. Enough to get to know the reactions of arbitrators is very difficult problems, but I'm mostly a litigator in arbitration. And you're also a professor. Right. It, it, it's, uh, oddly enough, it serves a purpose in this field because you argue cases before arbitrators quite often, so it's important to be part of the club. So in your spare time? <laughs> in my spare time, I do arbitration work, of course, <laughs> to, as, a, as a hobby. Um, thanks for taking some time to talk to us. As, as I mentioned to you when we were speaking a little while ago, uh, the, the lawyers of the infrastructure legal organization are many and varied in, in different locations. Um, some of them, like, like me, uh, have some degree of experience with international arbitration. Others uh, may, not, they may not have uh, reason to, to have experience. Um, and what I thought I'd talk to you about is a, a little bit about what our, our values are for international arbitration, or rather our values for dispute resolution clauses. Um, when we negotiate our contracts, uh, to the extent that you know, we're, we're looking to, to capture principles or values in those contracts, we want a dispute resolution clause to provide, obviously, for a, a fair form of dispute resolution, something that gives us you know, certainty or a degree of, of you know, an acceptable degree of certainty that our contracts will be enforced as they're written, but that it's also efficient that, you know, we know that we can get fairness if, if a case goes on for 10 or 15 or 20 years, but that is probably just too long for the company uh, for us to wait. So how, how do you, what, what's, what's the mix these days? What do you think in, in going, you know, a business that's global, working all over the, the, the map, how can we go out and try to capture those and, and meet our objectives of fairness, certainty, and efficiency? Well, I understand those values and, and indeed share those values, and I think if you want to achieve fairness and efficiency, you have to work on a number of uh, parameters. One is the place of arbitration, the other is the number of arbitrators, and you may want also to discuss uh, the issue of uh, adding a time frame to the arbitration in the clause itself, but that's of a secondary importance as compared to the place of arbitration and the number of arbitrators. Okay. Um, for example, I mean, we would say... Well, the, the, the place of arbitration today, most pro-arbitration countries, uh, uh, i.e. a large number of countries, have more or less the same rules and the same law on arbitration. What makes a huge difference is the style of arbitration and the extent to which courts, the local courts, will interfere in the arbitral process. Of course, you should stay away from the local courts which have a tendency to interfere a lot, like India, Pakistan, a number of countries would interfere a lot, and that's well known. You want to well known. You want to stay away from those countries in terms of the state of the arbitration. But now, when you look at the pro-arbitration countries, the, the friendly environments, you still have huge differences if you use a common law, generally a common law country or a civil law country. In unfortunately and this may change, but it's not yet uh, there, in the U.S. and in England, the courts have a tendency to interfere in the arbitral process a lot more than in uh, civil law countries, France, Switzerland in particular. And 
by choosing an arbitration in London or an arbitration in Paris or Switzerland, it's going to make a huge difference in terms of cost in two respects. One, the courts may interfere in London uh, a lot more. For instance, if there is a dispute on the validity of the arbitration agreements, the courts in a Fiona Trust case of 2006 have taken the view that it's for the courts to decide this. So if you have your arbitration, it may start, but then you may have to stop right away because the other is making an allegation of fraud or whatever, and the courts have taken the view that this allegation is going to be decided by the courts themselves, talking about the English courts. So there may be good courts and they may end up with the right result, but the cost associated with that is maybe enormous. Now, if you are in France or Switzerland, for instance, the, probably the two most arbitration-friendly uh, countries in the world, the courts would say, uh, no, ask the arbitrators. The arbitrators are good enough to resolve that, even if it's an allegation of fraud, even if this allegation of fraud touches on the arbitration agreement itself. In that case, the arbitrators can decide this, should decide this, and if their award is bad, there will be some control after the fact, but if you don't pause, you don't stop the arbitration just because you have an issue regarding the arbitration agreement. And in terms of cost, this makes a huge difference. And also the tendency, uh, even if you don't have this ancillary litigation, the tendency in, in England and in the US is to emulate the courts before arbitrators and you would have lengthy arbitrations, uh, say an arbitration which would take a week or 10 days in Paris or Geneva may take three, four weeks in London. So, and there is a balance between the, the, the effectiveness and the, uh, and, and the fairness. Uh, we think on the continent that you can have uh, a good arbitration, even if you hear only six witnesses and not 35 witnesses, and if you hear them in a week and you do necessarily need three weeks. So, uh, you know, all depending on the matter and the size of the, uh, of the, of the dispute. So, so by choosing uh, the right place, you may streamline your arbitration um, uh, vastly. Now, you know, it, would, it would be interesting to cross the channel and have this discussion because when I go to London and talk to arbitrators there, what they say is the way to fix the problems with international arbitration and the slowness and the time is to cite them all in London because then you'd have access to this wealth of international arbitration experience and efficiency. Um, yeah, but in fact, that, I, I've heard that said before. No, that, I, that, I that The cure to arbitration problems is just to do them in London with the with well, English that's what they say. No, no. The, the problem is that if you mm -hmm. listen uh, now, there is a, a, a huge competition between the, the venues. So if you ask local lawyers, even in large transnational firms, they would tell you that their jurisdiction is the best. Now, what you should ask the question to firms who have a global arbitration practice and, frankly, who do not care for themselves where the arbitration is located. Right. Uh, it's true of a number, it's true of Sherman Sterling, but also a number of other firms who have a genuine transnational practice. And if you ask those uh, experts, and certainly those not, not the local lawyers in the team, but the heads of the team, they would tell you in fairness that in, in London, uh, you would have more court intervention, too much. The English 